Okay, good morning. I'm um, going to tell you a bit of a story to get going, and it's how I came to using Python in my teaching, which um, kind of unrolled in the last academic school year. But the history of it's a little bit deeper than that. So the title is kind of long. My discipline within electrical and computer engineering is signal processing and communications. All of us are very familiar with that. Not that we know the theories of it, but we all carry wireless devices in our pockets. We use electronic gadgets. We're surrounded by it, right? So the kind of stuff that I do is develop algorithms that go into those devices. I um, sometimes in, am involved with the hardware design, but anymore, most everything I do is developing algorithms that end up um, in prototypes and then end up being instantiated into actual hardware, maybe silicon, um, for government and commercial applications. So when I say government, I mean um, in Colorado Springs, I work in SATCOM because we have a lot of interest in SATCOM in Colorado Springs and the military side. Commercial side, it might be wireless devices um, for commercial um, cellular telephony or wireless chipsets and so on. So a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about is how I got started and how I'm moving forward on that. Second topic will be how when I came to Py using Python, I bumped into scipy.signal and how I've augmented that for the needs of my teaching and uh, research and in consulting work. And then I'll move on to talking about usage scenarios. Um, I have IPython Notebook in the title of the paper. That's really a new thing that I started um, last summer, and I'll explain that when I get there. But then um, I'll go into some case studies where I've used it in teaching. Case studies in industry I won't talk about just because proprietary. And then I'll have some conclusions and things I want to move along into. So how did I get started? Well, in the summer of 2013, a book was published called Signals and Systems for Dummies. It was a book that I was commissioned to write. I didn't ever think I'd write a dummies book, but I had an agent come and find me, and I agreed to it. So the book was started, um, it came out two summers ago, but it was started about um, one year prior to that. So at that time, I decided because in all my teaching of signals and systems, I've used MATLAB all the time, but I decided I wanted to make it a book that people could pick up and use anywhere in the world and have the software readily available to do experimentation, simulations, and really visualize the mathematics within that. So the dummies people um, are good at publishing and they're good at making people write to the form of their style of publication. They didn't know anything about what it meant to have software included with a book, so I kind of told them that I was going to use um, Python. And they didn't know the difference between Python and MATLAB, so to me that was kind of like I was maybe fooling them, but I said, this is what I want to do, and they let me do it. So that's how I got started. At that time, I didn't use the notebook because it really wasn't I played with it some, but I didn't really visualize where it was going to go, so I stayed with the console. I think the QT console is what I did all my developing in of the materials and then producing plots and things that went in the book. So the book is entirely produced with that. I also used Maxima for symbolics because I didn't know anything about um, SymPy at that point either, although one of my editors wanted me to do that. But at any rate, next step. Um, is the community that I work in and how that influenced me. I was working, I do a lot of consulting, so I had um, companies that used to buy me the commercial software, MATLAB in this case, whatever I wanted. And then about the same time, companies were saying, we're not buying you a seat, we'll let you network in. And I wasn't really happy with that. Um, I have educational licenses, but I have to use commercial licenses when I do consulting, of course. So that kind of forced me to look at alternatives. But if I look at my, my discipline, you see MATLAB is up here on this slide, and I have um, well-established, I mean, the word is entrenched, actually, 
and I can speak with some authority on that because I'm the one that brought it to my campus. I've used it for over 20 years, which maybe sounds like I've got to be really old, and I'm not real young, I'll say that. Um, entrenched is, is absolutely the case because some of you maybe can remember the beginnings of MATLAB. It started off really for people like me because the first tool, toolboxes they had was signals, processing, and controls. So those were developed for, you know, types of things I do. So that's just the beginning of where they went off and went into. So I'm still working on that with my colleagues, but because I'm a senior faculty member, I can do what I want to do, I think. Um, some of you maybe know what I'm talking about. I mean, what's at risk? I don't have tenure or anything like that. I don't have rank to worry about or anything like that. So I said I'm going to do, make some changes. And the third bullet kind of explains that. Um, open source software is increasing, and higher education should not ignore it. As a matter of fact, I think my dean would be really happy if we could save some money in the college, but I'm also responsible for spending that money because I'm the one that, that actually set that up many years ago. So then in my sabbatical of a year ago, I worked for a small business that actually has Python in, a, in the workflow and I don't mean Python just to do testing and other things that electrical engineers have been using Python for many years for, but actually scientific Python, NumPy and SciPy. So I just had to work with a few of um, the PhD types that were entrenched into MATLAB and try to convince them. And I had an office mate who I worked with them day by day, just sort of shaking them, saying, look, you could do it this way. And eventually, I cracked him. So he. Um, uses Python now. We write in C and C++ for high-speed um, signal processing, but... And then last summer, I had somebody who was an intern from Georgia Tech who needed to learn Python, and he was coming from state zero. And um, at one point, I said, well, you could also start learning it in, in the notebook. So I showed him the notebook, and then he became absolutely he fell in love with it, basically. By the end of the summer, he was doing his presentation for what he had done in his internship in the IPython notebook. And I said, OK, that's how I'm going to roll it out this past fall to my students who only knew MATLAB. So um, what I do in my teaching now is um, use notebooks interactively in the lecture. And I'm going to attempt to do that here as part of my case studies and also um, because I've showed the students how to go into LaTeX um, and PDFs, I'm now getting those turned in as homework papers. I'm a, I'm a traditionalist. I don't grade papers electronically. I grade them still on paper. But um, turning in PDFs created via LaTeX in the notebook uh, markdowns and everything, it's meant for when they do it right, the papers are extremely well organized, I'll have to say. How many students want to go to that extreme? It's, it's still a rather small number, but by the end of this past spring semester, almost everybody was working with producing LaTeX PDFs. So I don't know what's going to happen this year because I'm going to continue to push on that. So in the module development, when I did the, the dummies book, this is just a view, and I realize it's low resolution, so it seems extremely fuzzy compared to the normal retina display resolution. But this is the collection of functions that I wrote to augment um, scipy.signal. And I could just point out um, some of these are communications things that create um, waveforms, um, baseband waveforms, as we call them in communications theory. I have a control set of examples on on there, it's actually all online. So one is a full model of a cruise control system that takes into account linearization of a nonlinear differential equation for a car going up a hill with wind drag and so on. We've got a number. So this package, which is located on my website with Sphinx documentation, people have said it needs to be on GitHub. I understand that now, but for this conference was my first real use of GitHub. I've used Git, but not the um, GitHub. So I, I can move it, but right now it is, it is easy to find. If you type into Google, you will find it pretty readily. 
is that's what people tell me, my students, and I can verify it. At any rate, this was the starting of it. It's all function-based. There's no classes in here. Since then, though, I started enhancing and writing, um, pulling out more functions to make a digital communications library. And because I'm, I was new, uh, an early adopter of MATLAB, it didn't have its communications package at the time, so I wrote a lot of functions on my own, and it was very easy to take my functions and rewrite them here. So I've started that, and that's been used where I do my consulting work and um, enhance that. Taught a phase lock loops class last summer, and I developed some more new functions uh, for doing synchronization in digital comm. That's a small collection at this point. And then I wrote a class to do convolutional coding and decoding that has some nice graphics primitives in that for really helping you understand what a Viterbi algorithm does. Now, most of you probably don't know, even know what who Viterbi is, but I'm guessing a fair number of you do because he was the, one of the founders of Qualcomm and their technologies are in lots of cellular telephony. He's the inventor of the Viterbi algorithm now and that's used for decoding in communications. I'm gonna demo some of that stuff assuming I don't, um, I can speed up here. So what are the usage scenarios? I use it during lectures. I have a semi-prepared mix. Um, I have LaTeX um, math dropped in there for my lecture notes. And I can do things interactively and on the fly. I also use it for computer projects where I have template notebooks um, with partial code frameworks in place. And in a real-time digital signal processing class this past spring, I experimented with using the notebook for lab reports. Now, does that sound possible? Well, it's, it, works, it worked beautifully. This is an embedded systems class where I'm using an ARM processor so I, we develop digital filters in the notebook. I write a function in the notebook to export out to a C header file, the coefficients, and then that goes into that development tool. And then I collect the data with another instrumentation package, take that data back in, import it in to the notebook and compare it with the theory and fixed point math and so on. And it works beautifully, actually. And the students, again, can turn in a PDF and they can fulfill one of the requirements in good lab work, and that is comparing theory to measurement. So the notebook worked there as well. I'm working with graduate students with notebooks, and I'm working with co-members in my team, um, co-workers in my team, and my consulting this summer with notebooks. So a couple of case studies. I'm probably only going to chance to show you one because I'm guessing I'm running down into my last five minutes, correct? Yes, that's okay. Well. Yeah, I understand. So I'm just going to show you one. Um, I was going to drill you into the, into the website, but I'm just going to show you one. Um, try to make this as big as I can. So this is a an analog communications project where they were implementing this block diagram. And let me see if I can make it just a little bit bigger. You can never tell how things are going to work unless you practice with this smaller resolution. Or, but this is a block diagram of wireless communication system. It's a multi-user system. So they had to build up modules to build a modulator that would put signals on different frequencies. And then there's a simulated channel in the green and then they build the demodulator. These are all um, function blocks that they build up in Python. So this is, um, a, the triangles there is a spectral view of saying how signals would sit in the frequency spectrum, thinking of your radio tuning to different stations. They're stacked next to each other. The more we compact them, the more uh, efficiently we make use of the radio spectrum. The more spread out they are, we waste spectrum, but the interference between them the adjacent channel interference or co-channel interference is less. So what I've got down below here is what they have to implement in digital signal processing in what's called a multi-rate digital signal processing development, which is common in, in devices we use. I give them, give them some examples of a framework um, and how they're going to have to write their modules. 
And then I have a top-level simulation which pulls in some of those modules. And when I finally wind my way down here, do some basic transceiver testing, I'm working with some speech vectors. So I've processed this particular one. Um, this is going to be the experiment, whether I can pull this off here and just show you how one of my favorite things in my area has been to use the audio control to actually process real speech vectors, manipulate the signal in this multi-rate simulation, and then be able to listen to what you've done. Hoist the load to your left shoulder. Take the winding path to reach the lake. Know closely the size of the gas tank. Okay, you heard interference in there. And I purposefully put the signals, jammed them closer together just so that you could hear it. But um, maybe that sounds like something you've heard before on a telephone line. I don't know. But um, it, it provides for um, a lot more excitement to actually listen to things is what that comes down to. And I would elaborate more, but I'm going to run out of time. So I'm now going to switch to the conclusions, which is get to get back to my slides. So the, the foundation of what I teach is all mathematical modeling and math, the mathematics is daunting to students and I definitely cannot make that go away but using a good modeling tools makes learning and problem solving more fun and generally it makes um, the atmosphere in the classroom more upbeat if people can feel like they're accomplishing things. And I'm not saying Python is the only tool that does that, but it is very convenient to be able to have an open source tool, have these um, notebooks, share code library bases, um, and also collaborate amongst um, people that way. So one of the things that I'll attribute this community to is the fact that when I was searching around for alternatives, it's um, the enthusiasm and the rapid pace of development that really attracted me to working with Python. I mean, everything was there that I needed except some core basic functions, and I could write those myself. Um, I can see that this going a long ways. So I want to enhance things. I want to get into using Cython to speed things up for some of my codes, but I think um, things are going well at this point. Questions? Thank you, Mark.